We're so glad to have everybody with us today. We're in a room just kind of loving on each other this morning. And, and again, we've got a friend that's uh, that needing your prayers. And uh, my friend, you, I talked about him some last week. Keep praying. He's fine. He's got some things going on, but he's fine in the Lord. And he's calm. And, and uh, But do be praying for my friend. And he gets some results back today. He may have already gotten them. But God's in control and God's good and God cares. Today we're going to be looking at a passage... Matthew chapter 8, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. We're going to pick it up before then. But in this particular passage, I'm just going to read the, the verses and then we'll go back and we'll talk about a lot. But this is what it is. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Uh, souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I was speaking one time down in, I was in El Salvador, in San Salvador, and it's a beautiful country, but very, very dangerous because of the uh, M13 gang. And they pretty much run the country now. But I remember we were in this, in this church and, and I was preaching on how to raise children under grace. That was the, the topic they wanted me to do. And I thought, well, Lord, I've never preached on that. And so I did, and, uh, and somehow this verse came to my mind, and it says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I said, well, folks, if your yoke's not easy and your burden's not light, it's not Jesus. Think about the stuff that you go through in life, the things that you carry your, as your own. And it's not easy and it's not light. God never intended for you to carry those things. In fact, I'm going to say this, God never intended for you to carry anything. He intended for you to give it to Him. Well, Jesus would say, you need not fear the future because I'm already there. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Wherever you go into the future, Jesus is already there. In time, we're in the present right now. Tomorrow is future. We spend most of our time worrying about tomorrow. Rarely do we worry about today. We worry about tomorrow. And there's grace sufficient for today. God knows, God cares, and He's got it worked out. Now I'm going to say, if you were like me, you would never have any of these issues. Because you all know, if you know me, that I'm perfect. I never have these kind of problems. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is lying wrong? Is it? Okay. I'm just like you. I go there too. And I, sometimes I hang out there. I hang out in the future when God wants me to walk in the now. Because you see... In eternity, everything is now. There is no past in eternity, and there is no future in eternity, and there is no time in eternity. And right now, you're actually in eternity. But we're also caught up in time. But one day, time will cease. Either you'll go from time into eternity, or as the shade is rolled up, one day I'll share that message with you from 2 Peter chapter 3, time will cease. And then it'll be all eternity. But the bottom line is, we live as if we are there now, because we are. Well, when we make that, that quantum leap into eternity, we'll find that, that He's waiting for us in heaven. But wait a minute. He's not really waiting for us to get to heaven. You know why? Because we're already there. I told somebody one time, I said, I think people are going to be very surprised. This was when I was in seminary, when God began to share this with me. I said, I think people are going to be very surprised when they get to heaven and they find out they were already there. He said, ooh, no, no, that's Gnosticism. I didn't know what that was then. That's Gnosticism. You may not know what it is now. Don't worry about it. And I thought, it is. I thought it says that we're co-seated in Him presently, in Him on His throne. Isn't that heaven? Aren't we there now? Of course we are. This is something else I was sharing with my friend that's going through some stuff. I used to think that people are going to be waiting in heaven, waiting for the ones they love to get there. You go ahead, we'll be there soon. There's no waiting in heaven. When we cross over, we cross over into eternity and we're going to find that they're already there. Even the ones that are going to come after us in eternity are already there because it's completed. Now, we can't understand that in time. 
That was almost like being two places at once. In fact, it is. We're in time and we're in eternity. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus was no longer bound by time. He could show up. You know, like the disciples when they were in a room locked and Jesus just showed up. And, and, and I used to think, well, Jesus got there. Then he left. No. You know what? The disciples saw for a minute or for a moment what was. Jesus is omnipresent now. He's God. He can be every place at once. How can that be? Because He is eternal. Do I understand that? No. Well, Jesus would say, don't be distracted by future concerns. Leave them to me. Leave them to me. It would be so great. It would be so great if we did that. I remember my dad, sometimes he would come home when we were little boys, so we got a surprise. What? Uh, we, we, I'll show you. I remember one time he came home. We were living in Columbus, Georgia. I was a little boy. Find, funny the things you remember. And he said, got a surprise. What? Come on, let's go. We all got in the car, and we went to a drive-in movie. I, you may not even remember that, Mother, but we did. A little boy remembers it. But, I mean, it was a surprise. Well, I wasn't really concerned about what the surprise was because I trusted my daddy. I just thought he was excited about it. He was smiling. He was whistling like he did. And, we, and I had fun at the drive-in. I don't remember what we saw. doesn't matter. But the thing is, we don't need to be distracted. And that's why I said that, distracted by the future. We need to live within the confines of today. No worries about the... Re no worries about tomorrow, no regrets about yesterday. It would be so wonderful if we could just do that. We would keep our focus on His presence in the present. Now this is how we, this is how we receive this abundant life which flows from Him. John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what he does. And I'm not just talking about physical things. Do you realize when you talk about somebody, we've all done it, when you talk about somebody, you're killing their reputation. Maybe you're not killing them physically. And if you want to talk about me or physically kill me, go ahead and talk about me if you would. But in truth, we're acting on behalf of the enemy when we do that. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. He says, I have come, they're talking about the Spirit, that they may have life and have it, it says abundantly, but it literally means have it to the full. I want it to be better than they ever thought. Well, today we're going to see about what I call the message would be, Worship me by resting peacefully in my presence. I want to read to you Jeremiah 29, 11 before we get back into uh, Matthew chapter 11. This is Jeremiah 29, 11, and this is talking about for eternity. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. What do you say to somebody who's about to be martyred? They're going to kill him. Maybe burned. Maybe have his head cut off. Maybe shot. Because of his relationship, not just with, but in Christ. Would this verse apply to him? Even more so. This is much bigger than time can contain. I'll read it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Is God planning on prospering somebody that's about to die? Absolutely. And not to harm you. Wait a minute. They're harming him. Plans to give you hope and the future. Our future is not on this earth. That is not our future. This present earth. Now there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a new Jerusalem for a capital city that's going to be 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles deep. That's kind of a big town, wouldn't you say? And I believe that you're going to be able to put literally a lot of folks, I don't know how many, in there. But you see, the universe is going to be our playground because it's all created by God for us. I don't understand that. Well, I think the Lord wants us to be all His, too. Now, we are. But for us to be all His, that's, to say, that's for me to say, Lord, I'm yours. You're, not, you're mine, but I'm yours. He is in the process of weaning us from all other 
dependencies. It's amazing how that people with no hope turn to the Lord. You say, well, yeah, they're only doing that because they have no hope. Uh, yeah. I've heard people talk about prisoners trusting Christ in prison. Yeah, that's what I call jailhouse religion. Well, I don't even like the term religion. That's jailhouse Christianity. Well, there are a lot of people in prison that turn to Christ. Why? Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? Maybe you should try it. Maybe you should try seeing, I have no hope outside of you. Well, He's in the process of weaning us from all that other garbage. He wants us to know that our security rests in Him alone and not in people or circumstances. If you try to put your, your hope in people, you're going to be disappointed. People go through life disappointed. So and so disappointed me. I have been very disappointed with that. So, what would you expect? You've disappointed people. You've disappointed people. That's all we can do. <laughs> I remember when I hadn't been saved very long and I was talking to a friend of mine, Tom Hinkle. I love Tom. Tom was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ and God really used him in my life when I trusted Christ. And I remember one day I said, I let God down. And he looked at me and he just started laughing. And he said, so? What else could you do in the flesh? And I thought he was going to say, tell me about it. Let's pray. You know, he didn't do anything. He just started laughing. Another friend of mine, Dan Carter, another time he basically said the same thing. I, was, I don't even know what the situation was. don't even know, but I felt bad. And he said, oh, God saw a little flesh, did he? And he wasn't being critical. He said, that's flesh. That's not who you are. That's not who you are. That's flesh. That's not your identity. We need to know that the everlasting, outstretched arms of Jesus are supporting us. And we don't need to be afraid of falling. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 27, it says, The eternal God is a dwelling place. And this word means literally refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And He who drove out the enemy from before you and said destroy. And said, destroy. This is now. He is a dwelling place for us now. It isn't going to be in heaven by and by. It is now. Well, going back over to... Why am I reading all that? Because this applies to what we're going to be looking at. Going back over into Matthew chapter 11. And Jesus has been talking to the, uh, to the folks of of the unrepentant cities. And when I hear people, let me just say one more thing. When I hear people talk about repentance, mostly they're talking about change of action, which is not truly what repentance is. Yes, you can repent of an action, but actions change when the heart changes. The repentance that comes is a change of mind. It's a change in the way you think. You can get people to start something and stop something and somebody else can get them to start it again after they've stopped it. That's not it. That's not the problem. When we, mostly what we talk about, when we talk about repentance in the church, and I'm sorry, we're talking about behavior modification. Doesn't work, hasn't worked, will never work. It's not permanent. But when people have a change of heart, a change of mind, and what comes, what comes from that? It's when we, here's where it starts. It's not starting with me. It's starting the way I think about Jesus. When I start seeing Jesus as a loving God, God the Father as a loving God, God the Holy Spirit, someone who comes and lives in me and gives me all that is theirs, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and that He loves me from eternity past and not going to change. And I stop seeing Him as a vengeful God that will get you if you don't straighten out. That is called repentance. When you begin to see those things, actions change, but not before. If you're still looking at God as a vengeful God, a mean God, a God that's going to do this, a God that's going to send you there, rather than a God who has purchased you, rather than a God who has chosen you from before the foundation of the world, rather than a God who out of His nature loves you unconditionally, then you need to repent. You need to repent of the way you think, and that'll change action. Well, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to the infants. What's he saying right here? If you think you're smart, then this stuff's going to be hidden from you. The infants. Does that mean like a two-month-old is going to know this stuff? No, it's talking about this. The guy that knows that he knows nothing apart from Christ and him crucified. Paul said that. 
and he realizes that Christ is my hope and I can trust him and he will reveal things to me. You don't even have to get it from the pastor. The Holy Spirit's quite capable of revealing things to you. But he's hidden it from the guys that think they got it all together, but he's revealing it to the babes. Verse 26, Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Look in verse 27. Now I want to show you something. He says in the English here in verse 27, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Okay? All things. What are we saying about the things here? Are we talking about the rocks and the trees and the moons and the stars and the water and the new cars and the old cars? You know, in the Greek, we have masculine, feminine, and neuter. If I talk about a rock, what am I talking about? It's an it's a inanimate object. It would be neuter. If I talk about a female dog, that would be a she. If I talk about a male dog, that would be a he. Neuter. It's not neuter. It has a gender. But if I'm talking about all the people, would I use masculine, feminine, or neuter? I would use neuter because I don't know what, what their gender is. So we're not talking just about inanimate objects here. We are in context talking about people. So look, look at it this way. Because things is not in the Greek. It's not there. Just all. It was added in the English. But listen. All have been handed over to me by my Father. Whoa. That's what that verse says. That is what that verse says in the Greek. All have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. No one. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal. Now, in, they went it and added Him in the English. It's not in the Greek. So what it's saying, He's not saying that some will know and some aren't going to know. He's not saying that. He's saying no one could know except for the revealing power of the Holy Spirit. You can't know the Father or the Son in your own power. And who has he given to Jesus? Talking to him, he says, All have been handed over to me by my Father. So who belongs to Jesus? All. You say, but all aren't going to believe. I don't believe all are going to believe either. I hope they do. I don't believe they are either. But I'm telling you, what he did for one, he did for all. Okay. Then he says in verse 28, Come to me, all. So who does he want? Everybody. That's what he said. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, who's weary and heavy laden on this earth? Do you know anybody that hasn't been? Do you know anybody that hasn't gone through trouble? Gone through trouble? Do you know anybody? I don't think so. There's nobody. There's nobody that hadn't been through trouble. Okay. Heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is his nature. He said, for I am gentle. It's his nature. And humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. That is fact. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that is fact. Well, why don't people rest in Jesus? Why don't they? Do you think people rest in Jesus? I don't think they do. Even Christians. I can understand why people that don't know don't rest. But why don't people that know rest? Well, they don't know who He is and He loves them and cares for them. You know, they've been taught that God is a, is a vengeful God. God is a God of wrath. They don't even understand what wrath is. I can preach a message on wrath. It's not what you think. Doesn't mean God's mad at you! The word is orge. It, means, it just really means strong emotion. Strong emotion. So much so that He loves you even when you don't like it or want it. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know His nature. They don't believe that He loves them and cares for them. That's why they don't rest. They won't receive His love and care given them from the cross, and they won't believe it. Now, it's true. It's true whether you believe it or not. He loves you and cares for you. But if you won't believe it, you will not live as if it's true. You can go through life not resting in great turmoil even though it's not true. 
Because well, it's not true that he doesn't love you. It is true that he loves you. He says, come. He says, come in verse 28. Come to me. Come. This is an aorist imperative. It means begin to do what you're presently not doing. He said, you are presently not coming to me. Start coming to me. Begin to do what you're not doing now. And sometimes this is the last thing that people want to do. But it's a command. Come to me. Come where? He says, to. And that word literally means toward. We don't even have to fully understand what we're doing when we, when we come. It's like when the children, remember the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were being bitten by the snakes. And the Lord told Moses to put a serpent up on a pole and put it in the center of the camp. Now understand, there were probably over two million Jews at this time. A bunch of folks. Now picture a city the size of Atlanta. Can you imagine putting a pole in the middle of Atlanta and saying, look at the pole, and when you look at the pole, you're going to be healed? Can you see the pole? Of course not. What do you do? You look toward the pole. They look toward the serpent. They didn't really see the serpent, but they just looked toward it. I'm telling you, it's the same thing right here. You don't have to know the outcome. You don't have to know what's going to happen. You won't know any of this stuff, but you can look toward Jesus. He said, come toward me, my final destination, my general direction. They couldn't see it in the, in the uh, wilderness, the children of Israel, and we may not be able to see the outcome, but we still look toward it. All who are weary, and this means being weary. This is a state of being and not an action. This happened, I'm weary. No, it's not it. That's not the problem. What happened is not the problem. The being wearied is a state of being. That's your lifestyle. And it follows unbelief. And it follows efforts in the flesh. The flesh cannot fix or satisfy. We want it to, but it can't. He says, I will give you rest. This would be better translated, I am resting again in you. I will give you rest. I am resting again in you. This means He is the one doing the resting in me. We can't even rest on our own. Rest. I know my wife, she loves this. Say, just chill, just relax. She loves that. Don't you love that? I love that, people. Sue, I'm just going to tell you, relax, Sue. Sue, quit being like you are. Just relax. Be like me. People say, oh, thank you for that wisdom. They don't think that. No, they say, shut up. That's what you think. That's what I think. I won't say Sue. Sue might, I don't know. What, I won't even go there. I won't even go there. <laughs> but my point is, we don't try to rest. We don't start to rest. We realize that He's doing the resting in us and we get on board and we let Him do the resting. As you rest from your labor, let's talk about this. Rest, this means to cause one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. To cause one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. This is to be a way of life. As you rest from your labor, His strength takes over. You rest His strength. Pretty good deal. He doesn't give you His strength. You begin to walk in His strength that He has already given you. Christ has nothing left to give you. Why? Why does Christ have nothing left to give you? He's already given everything. He's given Himself. All that is His is yours. And this is not what He will do. It is what He has done. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke. This is again is an aorist imperative. Begin to do what you're not presently doing. This word take means to raise up. Take is yours what has already been given you. This word yoke, it's a metaphor. And in this case, it's a metaphor for any burden or bondage. His yoke. It's His burden. It's His bondage. <laughs> it's His effort that overcomes these things. It's not yours that overcomes anything. Then He says, learn from me. Again, aorist imperative. Begin to do what you're presently not doing. Begin to learn. In this word learn, it means to be appraised. It means to increase one's knowledge. Increase one's knowledge. Okay. What I would say today, if I were translating that word, learn what already is. 
Learn what already is. Then he goes on to tell us what already is. What are we to learn? It's not what we do. What are we to learn? Here's what we learn. He goes on to tell us. I am gentle and humble in heart. That's what we learn. I am gentle. I am humble in heart. This word gentle, it's the word meek or mild. We have the idea that mild or meek means sissy or weak. It doesn't. They would talk about a stallion. You've probably heard me say this. And they say, a stallion has been meeked. You know, the, the stud horse. And meek doesn't mean he's weak. That just means his power is now under control. Jesus was the meekest man that ever lived. Moses was referred to physically as one of the meekest men to ever live. Well, this meekness toward God, it's a disposition of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good and therefore, without disputing or resisting, I don't resist what it is that God has. I, I don't like some things in this flesh, some things you don't like, so you didn't like stuff you went through. Cancer three times, you're still here. Well, even if you weren't here, you'd still be here. But you're still here physically. We put a lot of stock in that being here physically, but in truth, it's temporary for all of us. Well, simply put, God is in control and He only means good toward you and me because it is His nature. God is good. God is love. God, if you read the Psalms, is for you. He says it over and over. God is for you. I am gentle and humble. This word humble means low estate, low degree. He does not see himself. Now this is amazing. He does not see himself as above you. Now this is going to sound crazy. The reason he doesn't see himself as above you is because he has given himself to you. And so he can't see himself as above you because all that is his is yours. If you wonder what your position is going to be in heaven, this is crazy but it's going to be like Christ. Now, you're not God. You're not God. You're never going to be God. But God the Father has brought you into Himself in the person of Jesus. Now, Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son, and the Son's in the Spirit, and the Spirit's in the Father. We are in this together as an act of the will of the Godhead. Then He says, You shall find... This word find, it means to come upon, hit upon. This is my favorite, one third thing. is the third definition of find. It means to meet with. You shall find rest. Read it this way. You shall meet with rest. His rest. Come to Him. You will meet with His rest along the journey. And that's just unreal. And this is what rest is for. It says for your soul. Rest for your soul. Now we get tired physically. That's okay. It happens. You know, you work, you get tired. But that's not the kind of rest we're talking about right here. We're talking about soul rest. And this isn't for when you die. This is for now. It's for your soul. The vital force which animates the body and shows itself in breathing. He says, my yoke is easy. And this word yoke means labor. Easy, better, goodness, gracious, fit, useful, virtuous, mild as opposed to harsh. Look at this. His yoke is better. His yoke is goodness. His yoke is gracious. His yoke fits. His yoke is useful. His yoke is virtuous. His yoke is mild as opposed to harsh. His yoke is my yoke. Now, this is the life you are experiencing. Yield to what is yours, what He has already given you. My load is light. This word load, it means burden, freight, or lading of a ship. It is his load, not yours. Now, I've been on one cruise in my life, one cruise. And 
when you're going to the cruise, you know, they, you have your passport, you're going through this long list of people there, and you've got thousands of people getting on that big boat, and you've got your luggage, and you know, you, gotta, you have to dress for dinner. You know, I, first time I'd ever dressed for dinner. At home, I just eat naked. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you wear a tie, you wear a coat, and you dress for dinner if you want to go to that place. Now, you can go eat in the buffet, and you, can, you don't have to dress in there. But you dress for dinner. So you have all these different clothes, and you've got shows at night. So it takes quite a bit of luggage. Now, we get to the ship. I almost said boat, but it's not. And then they separate you from your luggage. They put your name on it, and they know where you're going to be staying. You go one way, your luggage goes another way, and you don't see your luggage again till you get to your room. And you're going to find your luggage is already in your room. You don't even have to tip the bellboy. It's already in the room. Now, on that ship, I can have a great time, or I can keep up with my luggage. Now, let me tell you what I never thought of one time while we were on that five-night cruise. I never thought one time, how's my luggage doing? And I'm going to tell you what else I didn't do. I didn't carry any luggage around while I was there. Not once. I didn't carry it. Now, the same ship that's capable of carrying me for pleasure and fun is the same ship that's capable and able to carry my luggage. So it would be silly for me to carry my luggage on board ship. Would it not be? Well, that's exactly what it is for us to carry our load on this earth. It's silly. It's just silly. I'll tell you what, when you're light, my, it means in weight. It means, you know, when it's light, this means quick or agile. I'll give you a good example of this. When David was about to fight Saul, not Saul, Goliath, and here this young guy was, teenager, little guy, and Goliath was this guy, nobody had ever seen anybody that big. I mean, he was huge, maybe over nine feet tall. His spear weighed more than some car. I mean, you know, it was just ridiculous for David to try to fight. But Saul said, David, you're too young, you're too small, you don't have experience. Here, put on my armor. And can you imagine it'd be like me dressing in my daddy's coats and ties when I was a little boy, three or four years old. And you've seen pictures of that? And that's how it was with David. Can you imagine David trying to fight Saul? Can you imagine him with that slingshot with Saul's armor on? He put it on and said, I can't move in this stuff. And he took it off because that, that wasn't what he was called to be or do. He was free. He was light. He was agile. And he won because he wasn't fighting with his strength. Well... It's the same thing here. You can easily change direction because you're not carrying a burden. I've known people, the Lord would put something on their heart and they would just say, and they would tell me about it. Well, I can't do that because I'm encumbered by this. I've got this. I've got this. I've got this responsibility. I'm dealing with this. I'll deal with those things. You just do what I'm telling you. But I can't, Lord. And they go through life not being able to. Can't, Lord. Because they're carrying things they were never intended to carry. Lay your burden down. We listened to a song today by the birds. The birds, that's right, the one from the 60s. And it's called Glory, Glory. Go to YouTube. Listen to Glory, Glory by the birds. You will be shocked. A non-Christian group, a hippie group, that understood more about laying a burden down, tragically, than most in the church. Lay your burden down. Well, we're done. I hope it's been a benefit to you. See you next time.